Chapter 2. The Rusty Axe. Two sounds grew louder as Grog jogged towards the center of Longdale. The clang of weapons hitting shields and the rasping rattle of his own labored breathing. Grog genuinely wondered what was more likely to kill him first. The blade of some unknown assailant or a sudden explosive art attack. Despite the pain in his body and the fear in his mind, Grog was still finding plenty of space in his brain for a sudden bout of serious self-loathing. Since leaving the army just over a year ago, he'd willfully let himself get completely out of shape. But he hadn't realized just how bad things had gotten until tonight. The battle axe felt heavy in his once mighty arms. His stomach bounced and flopped embarrassingly, and sweat gushed from what seemed like every pore. It was as though Grog's bodily fluids knew the fate that was about to befall him and were making good their escape before they were dragged into any further foolishness. He was deciding whether to stop for a quick vomit before he reached the fighting when a young dwarven woman cornered the houses at the end of the street and came running towards him. She was clutching a toddler in her arms and shouting wildly. Grog couldn't make out her words over his wheezing breath the sounds of nearby fighting, and the blood pounding in his ears. But he was sure it wasn't a cheerful greeting. He placed the head of the battle axe on the cobbles, leaned heavily on the heft, and took a couple of deep breaths. As the woman drew close, he held up a hand in a halting gesture. Lass, he gasped. What is happening? Run, you chubby bastard! She yelled. Hey! I'm here to... Grog turned and watched as the woman ran past him and disappeared into the darkness. To help? Pretty bloody rude. Grog thought to himself as he turned back towards the center of town. But then the woman's pursuers came tearing around the corner and he immediately wished he'd taken her wise and excellent advice. They were dwarves, sort of. They were the same height and build as dwarves, but most dwarves Grog knew didn't have glowing blue eyes or pale purple-hued skin, nor did they growl and gurgle madly like a pack of rabbit dogs. These ones did. They also carried a variety of clubs, spears, and maces, and were headed straight for him. Grog felt like he'd been dropped into a frozen lake. His muscles contracted, and his breath caught in his lungs. The creatures that had decimated his army during the War of Endless Fog and plagued his nightmares for the last 14 months were no longer confined to mist-filled valleys deep in the mountains, or even to his own tormented memories. They were here, deep inside the Thirteen Realms, and this time, there was nowhere to run. You... Bastards, Grog whispered, tightening his trembling fingers around the heft of his axe. You, utter bastards, he shouted as the abomination slowed and formed a semicircle around him. There were six of them. They snarled as they closed in. Come on, then. Grog lifted his axe and set his feet. The ghoulish dwarves charred. Grog spun, his axe cleaving the air in a wide circle. It kept his attackers at bay for a moment. But then, one of them thrust forward with an obsidian-tipped spear. Grog threw himself sideways, hitting the cobblestones hard. As he rolled to his feet, a bone club caught him a glancing blow across the back of his shoulder. Roaring with rage and pain, Grog lashed out with his axe. It was a wild strike which missed his assailant by a mile. It also left him wide open to the particularly nasty-looking spiked mace, which was being swung at his ribcage by a dwarf with deep, bloodless gashes across its unliving face. Grog threw himself to the street again, this time dropping his axe in the process, and also failing to completely avoid the blow. The spikes of the mace tore across the side of his buttock, as he fell, gouging channels of agony into his unprotected flesh. 
He rolled away from a stabbing spear, looking desperately for his weapon. But the hideous dwarves advanced on him, and he was forced to scramble backwards like a wounded shellless crab across the cold cobblestones. It'll be over soon, Grog thought as he backed into the side of a house. I'm ready to go. The evil dwarves raised their weapons. Grog had time to feel ashamed that after all he'd done and all he'd once been, these were his final thoughts. He closed his eyes. A brief chorus of high-pitched whining noises sang in his ears, followed by a series of wet, crunching sounds, followed by the clatter of weapons hitting the ground in front of him, and six dwarf-sized thuds. Grog opened his eyes. The abominations were all lying face down on the road, with arrows protruding from the backs of their necks. A squad of Longdale guards were running towards him, with bows in their hands. Are you all right? Their leader asked, holding out a hand towards Grog. I've been better, Grog said, reaching up and grasping the extended hand. With a grunt of considerable effort, the dwarf hauled Grog to his feet. He was an imposing figure, with a thick black beard, war paint covering half his face, and a jagged scar cutting across his milky white left eye. You're a Kingsguard, Grog blurted. I am, said the scar-faced dwarf, and you are a lucky bastard. Are you injured? Cut me right in the arse, Grog said, twisting and shoving his gut out of the way as he tried to inspect his right buttock. The Kingsguard sucked in a sharp breath. Oh, that's going to leave a lovely scar. And on my finest feature, too, Grog said, gingerly touching a finger to the wound. It came away, covered in blood. Anyway, friend, hop out of the way while we deal with this lot. I'd say you've already dealt with them, said Grog. The king's guard shook his head. Nope, I'm afraid not. Look. Grog turned, looked, and was horrified to see the fiendish dwarf creatures beginning to move. Most were slowly reaching back for the arrows stuck in their necks. One was already clambering to its knees. Hold this, would you, Val? The king's guard held out his bow. Grog grabbed it as the guard stepped past him, unclasping sturdy axes from their belts. You've got to take their heads off, the king's guard explained matter-of-factly. While the scar-faced dwarf and his squad hacked away, Grog limped over to retrieve Hennig's battle axe. Take off their heads, Grog thought, trying to fight down the waves of shame and regret rising up from his guts. We never even knew. All right, dwarves, the king's guard shouted. Let's keep going. Where are you headed? Grog asked. We are to take news of this attack to the High King. The king's guard looked almost longingly back towards the center of the town, where flames were leaping into the night sky. We wanted to stay, but guard commander's orders. Agent wants to go with you, then, Grug said. I'll... He gestured towards the sounds of battle that emanated from just a few streets over. I'll do what I can. Don't be stupid, said a female guard with a large gold septum ring protruding from her nostrils. You smell like a brewery, and that's not just a scratch on your arse. You're in no state to fight, big guy. You'll just get yourself killed. Pixidus is right, the king's guard said, sheathing his ex. Try and get clear of the city. Maybe find a place to hide. I'm not running away. I'm never... <sighs> Grug trailed off. I'll be all right. There was a look of extreme doubt on the face of the king's guard as he looked Grog up and down. Then he shrugged. Suit yourself, mate. We don't have time to argue. Let's move out. What's your name? Grog asked as he handed the bow back to the king's guard. I need to know the name of the dwarf that saved my life. Coppermantle, the scar-faced dwarf said, clasping Grog's forearm with an iron grip. 
Daristral copper mantle. Then he turned and jogged off down the street. Grog watched them go. Then he lifted him axe and tried giving it an exploratory swing. As he suspected, his left shoulder protested with a surge of pain from where the bone club had hit him. The battle axe was no longer an option. On the bright side, the agony in his shoulder briefly made him forget about the searing fire in his buttock. He limped over to the headless corpses, averting his gaze as best he could, while looking around for a weapon. You, he said to the spiked mace which had injured his bottom. I'll take you. He leaned Himig's axe against the wall of the house and picked up the mace. He gave it a swing with his good arm. I'm calling you, arse ripper, he said to the weapon. Then he rested its handle comfortably across his good shoulder, adjusted his steel helm, and began limping towards the sounds of battle.